Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a show that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region because business matters. My guest on today's show will discuss bringing tourists and the locals back to local amenities, the cultural attractions, the shops, the eateries, the brew pubs. After the pandemic upended the winning streak Virginia's Blue Ridge had enjoyed, Landon Howard is president of Visit Virginia's Blue Ridge. Catherine Fox is vice president of the Public Affairs and Destination Development for VVBR. Pete Eshelman and Julia Boas are with Roanoke Outside and the Roanoke Regional Partnership. Pete is the Director of Outdoor Branding for the Partnership and Director of the Roanoke Outside Foundation. And Julia is the Events Director. And let's uh, let's start by going around the room. Let's think back a year ago, and this will air, you know, sometime uh, about a year plus after the pandemic started. Talk about Landon and Catherine, where, visit, where Virginia's Blue Ridge was a year ago. You guys were coming off a 10-year winning streak on hotel revenue growth. And, and just uh, look, look, what were you expecting before the pandemic hit, you know, going into 2020? Well, I will say, wow, uh, 2019, 2020, fantastic. Everything was book solid. Uh, we had great uh, sports coming in. We had conventions. Uh, we were uh, approaching a billion dollars in direct spending uh, by, by visitors in the Virginia's Blue Ridge region. And we were, we, the sky was the limit. And uh, we had up to 11 hotels that were either uh, being planned or about to go under construction because of the heavy demand. And, and then the pandemic hit uh, in uh, March of 2020. 11 hotels. So do you know, you have any idea, Landon, how many of those actually, uh, projects move forward or are some of those on hold at this point? The majority of them are on hold. Uh, there is one that's under construction in downtown uh, Roanoke uh, and then also uh, at exit 137. Uh, there's another property that's being built right now. And uh, and I don't know, uh, vice president, our vice president of destination development might can help me out if there's any others under construction right now. <laughs> I would just say that many of them were in the planning stages, and I would th also say that many of them were looking for financial support and backing, and and I believe that many of them that were proposed are still completely, there are on hold. Um, you know, our hotel industry has taken quite um, a step back in, in their um and their planning stages as well as their budgeting, and uh, th they've had to reevaluate uh, any expansion. So we, we hope that that will, will happen again. And maybe. And I remember, I'm sorry, I remember Catherine talking to one local hotelier we all know, and it, in the throes of the pandemic shutdown, he said their business was down like 95%. I mean, how do you keep, it's hard to keep the doors open like that, you know? Ag agreed, and we've done what we can. I, I think all of us on, on this, in this conversation have done what we can to try to build back um, some some uh, sustainability for our hotels, our attractions, our restaurants. Um, you know, there has been some ups and downs with the restrictions and uh, still allowing certain people to travel. And our hotels have done an incredible job of welcoming visitors to the best of their ability within the protocols. All right, let's, uh, let's talk to Pete and Julia from Roanoke outside and talk about Pete, where you guys were a year ago. You were probably looking at maybe what record numbers for the Blue Ridge Marathon or you go fest uh, was coming off a, a nice year. Just talk about where you guys were a year ago. Sure. I mean, I, I think that the entire region, everyone included, you know, visit Virginia's Blue Ridge. Um, everybody was just really building upon the successes that the region has had over the past, you know, five, six, seven years. Um, and, and, and we're, we're, we were too, uh, you know, things were building momentum was building. Um, like you said, the Blue Ridge Marathon, you know, we've seen consistently a 10 to 15% uh, increase year over year. So we were set to have another record year, you know, bringing close to, you know, 3000 people, uh, you know, to the region, uh, the go outside festival was set to have another record year of 40,000 plus people kind of connecting people with the outdoors and the active, uh, healthy lifestyle. So, you know, the, the past year for us has, uh, you know, been kind of really figuring out how do we keep the momentum moving? Uh, you know, how do we keep 
building on this community narrative uh, that we've been working on for the past 10 years. Um, and, and we've had a lot of successes in that even during this pandemic. So it's a, uh, I think it's an exciting times, uh, you know, for our community, um, you know, the hotels, the small restaurants, you know, you kind of were talking about it earlier, but you know, they were hit hard by this. And I think, but our community has really stepped up to, you know, support small local businesses. And um, it's, it's, it's been exciting. I'm excited to see what happens. Julia, you're the events director, Julia Boas. What, what did you learn about last year? Were you, were you able to convert some of the events into virtual events? I believe the Blue Ridge Marathon, for instance, went virtual. Yeah, we did do a virtual version of the event. And like Pete said, you know, we've been amazed at how Roanoke as a community has stepped up. We've done some different fundraising efforts, like through GoFest, we did um, a socially distanced benefit concert, as well as a bunch of like virtual things that people could participate in as a fundraiser. Um, and so we created this new foundation or this new fund called Project Outside. And we were able to raise $100,000 through that fund um, and so then, we, you know, we did a grant application process. And so we're able to actually uh, fully fund 14 different projects or some of them were um, some of the grants had stuff to do with like small businesses, recouping some costs and things like that, or maintenance that was deferred because, you know, they lost their funding through COVID. So there has been a silver lining, you know, obviously last March when everything started happening, it was, I was like first person to be in full denial. Like this isn't happening. <laughs> We're not canceling. I'm not canceling anything. Like I hate canceling. I hate saying like, no, we're not going to do this. Like I never give up. I never surrender. And so like COVID was definitely something that was just like, you, takes your control away. You have no control over what's happening. So you almost at a certain point, I just had to be like, okay, there's nothing you can do about it. Like let's move forward and think about the good stuff. But yeah, like these guys were saying, we had so many amazing things planned for 2020 and some like artists and concerts and things were coming that we've never had at that level, you know, stuff that was finally like happening for Roanoke. It was all happening. And it was just, you know, so that bubble was burst, but like Pete said, I, I think that the opportunity is still there. It's just going to take a lot of people like us working towards making it happen again. How many people, Pete and Julia, how many people continue though to, come to Roanoke or even locals that continue to hike and paddle and bike and all that was in, in some ways. Uh, and you heard a lot about this where at least if you're outdoors, you're a little bit safer from the pandemic or could the coronavirus. So were people, did you see evidence still that people were? Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, I think this pandemic has created a lot of firsts, a lot of firsts for everyone, including a lot of first time outdoor users. I mean, people are discovering uh, the outdoors as a safe place uh, to be during the pandemic. Um, you know, so our, our outdoor spaces have seen upwards of 200% increase during this, uh, during this time. So, and I think that you know, that's something that we should be excited about. You know, we're kind of introducing more people to this and, and um, but, you know, for us, and that's kind of what, you know, Julia alluded to kind of why we started the project outside fund is all this, uh, all these new users out there impacting and using the resources is awesome, but we owe it to make sure those are in top you know, condition for the people that are using them, um, especially visitors that are coming here. And I'll let Landon and Catherine talk to the visitors surge, you know, during this time, because there's definitely people that are looking to get out of the densely populated area. So we're really well situated for that. But even prior to the pandemic, you know, we had been seeing this increase in use of our outdoor assets, you know, trails, river put-ins, greenways. Um, and we, we did a, in 2018, we did an outdoor infrastructure impact assessment of the entire outdoor assets throughout the region. So we worked with two consultants, one out of Boulder, Colorado, and one out of Austin, Texas. And um, the, the takeaway, there's lots of different takeaways, <clears throat> but the one of the key takeaways is as a region, we have to make sure that we're adequately funding the maintenance of these assets. You know, we have, you know, hundreds of miles of trails throughout the region that for the most part are all built and maintained by volunteers. Um, and so, you know, as a, you know, the communities like they fund shiny new things, but not necessarily the maintenance dollars that follow suit. And so we've been having conversations about what's it going to take to adequately maintain our existing outdoor infrastructure, as well as invest in new ones, you know, kind of whatever that may be, is it new river access points, things like that. Um, 
then the pandemic hit. Um, and that's, uh, you know, where we're talking about, we didn't want to lose this momentum that we were building. And so that's kind of what led us to start project outside, which was an opportunity for residents and businesses to kind of, uh, that see the value in the outdoors and this new community narrative and the kind of, you know, uh, step up and fund that. And so, as Julia said, you know, uh, uh, we raised over a hundred thousand dollars. We were able to issue grants, uh, 14 grants were awarded from that, but those funds came from, you know, individual donations, business donations, businesses kind of pivoted and adjusted and made changes, uh, and, and donations to it. So, you know, $10 from every bike sold, for example, was one way that a business contributed to that. So we're really excited to see how the community stepped up. Um, and now we're excited to see these projects implemented. Before I go toss it back to Landon and Catherine, so it'd be, before the project outside, you would even start a uh, fund to build another dock at Carbon's Cove, something sure. that came through pretty quickly. And did, did that sort of encourage you that there are people in the region that are willing to give a few bucks to improve our outdoor amenities here? Yeah, absolutely. And that's uh, prior to Project Outside, it had been on a per project basis. You know, so what we do is, a, you know, community comes to us and they say, hey, we have this great idea. And we're like, well, if you're willing to be the champion, we're going to help you kind of, you know, find that funding and help you crowdfund that. And, you know, the first one we did was the kayak launch at the bridges, uh, you know, on the Roanoke River. Uh, funds were used to fund four other river access projects throughout the region. Then the dock at Carvin's Co. was another one and a bike park at Morningside. And, and so those are just examples of that kind of demonstrate that people are willing to put their money in air, in areas and projects that interest them. Mm -hmm. Landon and, and Catherine talk about what you saw as far as outdoor activity last year and talk also about, and this is, goes back to the partnership too, that this is also a way to attract talent and businesses to the region as well. It's not just to bring people here for a few days, correct? It's, it's to really to make people think this is where I want to live and want to work. That's the whole point, you know, is to really, for us, I mean, this, this is where our organizations complement each other. Our focus is on leveraging these to attract talent and businesses to the area. Um, and some of what we do, you know, like the marathon does have a tourism byproduct and, and that's where they, they, they start to intersect. Um, but the synergy is pretty incredible. Before so, I go back to Landon, I just want to ask Julie real quick about the marathon. We're, we're planning to air this in April. You are planning for a live Blue Ridge marathon this year. Yeah, we're moving forward with a live event. You know, we do still have some hurdles yet, yet to jump just with like resource allocation and things. You know, things are tight with all the all the cities resources going to vaccine allocation and things. But, you know, I think we're working in the right direction and I still have a lot of optimism that we're going to make it happen. And the other thing was that people, if they still want to run it virtually, they can run it any time in April, correct? Yeah. First through the 30th of April, they can run the actual course and we have like an app that they can get turn by turn instructions or they can just do it from anywhere in the country, basically. Okay. That's been Let a blessing of the virtual is people that normally wouldn't travel to it are now running the Blue Ridge Marathon and learning about us as a region that live from you know far away. So that's kind of a cool, I guess, a blessing that came from uh, all these virtual races. Mm hmm. I know some people that are training for the double and they get up, you know, at 20 degrees in the morning, they're training for the double. So they're, they're kind of nuts. So Landon, let's go back to you and Catherine talk about again, the, what, what you saw anecdotally, maybe or numbers wise, were people still coming to the region last year? And from, from your viewpoint too, isn't a lot of this about uh, attracting talent to the region and possibly employers? Well, we were very fortunate in 2020 and the fact that we have such an incredible outdoor product and, uh, 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 around our office, we were talking about if, uh, just about every cabin and canoe was taken in 2020. And uh, many of our bike shops reported to us that uh, they had totally sold out of bicycles. And uh, then we also found out just recently that uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway was the most visited national park in America. And uh, usually we're kind of in the top three, but 2020 was really great for the Blue Ridge Parkway because people were getting out and enjoying our outdoor amenities. And it really gave us an opportunity, unlike many destinations, which do not have what we have, the hundreds of miles of trails and our rivers. And incidentally, uh, USA Today just named uh, the Roanoke River as uh, one of the top three um, best urban rivers in North America. And uh, and the word's getting out about uh, Virgin Virginia's Blue Ridge. Uh, people are wanting to come here. Uh, a lot of folks are coming in from Washington, D.C. area, North Carolina, et cetera. 
And uh, yes, it, uh, we consider ourselves the first date for economic development. Once people come here, they love it. And people are working more and more virtually. And so we see some potential significant potential growth as part of that. And I'm sure Catherine could probably add to that. I, what I can add is that in um, 2020, we had about 1.3 million uh, unique users to our website. And in 2019, we had 1.6. We really tried to, to build on new content, um, new opportunities to, to Pete's point, a lot of our outdoor amenities, um, some of our um, probably top amenities were being used, utilized a great deal. So we tried to give people those lesser known um, locations to use. So we, we built on that. Um, we built on some of our takeout maps. So you can find a restaurant to get takeout to keep our restaurant sustainable, our virtual events. Um, we, we really uh, built on those as well. So we, we really are the first impression uh, for the region. And um, our job is to get people to recognize that outside of the region. So um, we're in the external market, um, getting that message out. Although we halted most of our marketing efforts, our social media efforts escalated um, probably 30% uh, more than in 2019 um, in, in terms of visibility through our social media platforms. Um, and then on top of that, Jean, I would have to say that we probably had about a 20% increase of locals using our website for this information. And it's interesting you say that because there's a lot of, and I think it's much less than it used to be, but there's a lot of people who don't really know all the, all the things that are available here to them. Uh, if, if they, you know, they don't get outside of their comfort zone. Talk about your website, Catherine, and all the work. Talk about how crucial that is and, and talk about things like the partner portal where you, you encourage your people that engage through your site to, to up, upgrade their information, keep it updated. Things they have going on, specials, amenities, things like that. Talk about how crucial that website is to what you're doing. The content is critical to be um, ref to be fresh, to be inviting, and we rely heavily on our partners to do that. But going back a little bit, Virginia's Blue Ridge represents two cities, the cities of Roanoke and Salem and the counties of Roanoke, Franklin, and Botetourt. Within that, and just in about an hour's radius, we have partners, about 1,500 of them who populate our website to make it um, attractive and inviting to the region. So we are constantly looking to those partners to keep us uh, with that content being fresh. So there's an opportunity where they can get into the website um, through a, an extranet or a partner portal, and they can keep their information updated seasonally with images, um, hours, truly hours of operation have changed dramatically for a lot of our tourism partners. Um, so it's trying to keep that information clear and correct um, for that first impression. Uh, so yes, we, we encourage our, our um, partners to use that and get that information, make sure it's correct and fresh um, because, you know, we want to make that first impression a good one. And I know one thing Visit Virginia's Blue Ridge uh, has been very successful at Catherine is uh, attracting travel riders to town. They'll come to town. They'll spend a couple of days here, check everything out, write a blog or a, an article or something. And have those really paid off? So in Landon, you can jump in here too. Um, our team has done an amazing job. Like all of us, we've pivoted to a very different format and a different platform. So we've had virtual um, visits by our journalists and um, that's been unique, but it's, it's really taken our partners outside of the box to take our journalists around to the region to get to see the area that they would have seen normally in person. Um, so these virtual visits mean a lot. And it's, it's so important to keep that message out there. This is, this is um, credible resources and information that gets to um, a variety of audiences. Um, and it, this is what we're always trying, whether it's bloggers um, and, and people, you know, it could be in print, it could be anything. But, um, you know, for all of us on this call, we've done a lot of um, polls, um, whether it's Blue Ridge Outdoors trying to get to be the, the best um, mountain town um, significantly and as well as the, the, the Roanoke River contest. So what we're seeing is a lot of our region and our visitor, or not just our visitors, but our residents really getting behind what we're doing. And I think that maybe if they didn't recognize what we were doing before, I think they do now more um, just because the pandemic has really put a spotlight on um, the tourism industry as a whole and how much it's impacted the area prior to covid um, in a positive way and how it's really um, challenged us um, and 
going forward after the pandemic. I want to bring up uh, Blue Ridge Outdoors Magazine and Julie and Pete. This has got to make you feel good. They uh, uh, voted the Blue Ridge Marathon the best marathon in the area, also the most missed marathon in the area. So uh, that, that's got to make toughest. you feel good. Don't forget the toughest. <laughs> oh, oh, always the toughest, yeah. <laughs> and we should mention that the Blue Ridge Marathon, obviously, is not just a full. It's a half. It's a 10K. And you've got a double, too. So Yeah, and a relay, um, a marathon relay, where you can split yeah. up the marathon course right. into three. And a family one-miler. <laughs> yeah, That's right. And, and that's something, you, the one you started on Sunday, and that was very successful, wasn't it? Well, that's, that's a different day. That's America's <laughs> slowest 5K. That's the one that Landon, I think Landon's going to do this year, right, Landon? <laughs> Count me in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the post-race sort of recovery run that we added in 2019. Was it 2019, Pete, or did we do it twice? Did we only do it once? No, we did it twice, 2018. Okay. So, yeah, we did it two years, and they just get, like, mimosas and coffee and donuts, and they just basically walk it, and we have, like, yoga and stuff along the course and additional mimosa stands. So you really just, like, it mm -hmm. just relax type of thing. <laughs> it definitely <laughs> sounds like my speed. Well, you, you, whoever comes in last actually wins the trophy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, so, it, it, you know, talk about what the, talk about what the uh, economic impact of the Blue Ridge Marathon has been over the past decade uh, as far as immediate in, uh, outcome and, and, and maybe long term. But talk about the impact that economic impact that that race has had over the past decade. Sure. Um, and that's been one of the things that we really tried to just, you know, do from the get go is really demonstrate that return on these events, on these, uh, on the events that we're doing. Um, because I think it's really important so that people understand, you know, what these events mean to our local economy. Um, and so from the get go, we've always done survey. We survey all the participants. We use a third party software um, that calculates that economic impact. And, um, you know, that's how, you know, every year it's kind of grown, just like the race has grown. So is that economic impact. Uh, that's how we're able to kind of tell how many people are coming from outside of the region uh, versus inside of the region. Um, and then kind of get a very accurate uh, kind of economic impact from these. And it's important to note that, you know, when people talk about the economic impact, if, if a local here, so if Landon goes and, and runs the Blue Ridge Marathon, his money doesn't count towards that economic impact because his money's already here um, in this area. So what we're talking about is money from new money from outside of the area that's kind of coming in. And, and so, uh, you know, to date that the events had a $5.8 million economic impact, um, you know, to the local economy. And then on top of that, you know, we work with several different local nonprofits. Uh, I think it's usually 10 to 12 nonprofits, right, Julia, you know, during the year that actually help us get all of the 400 plus volunteers. And we make donations to those nonprofits in exchange for helping us get those uh, volunteers. So, you know, I think every year we're donating upwards of $15,000 to local nonprofits. So it's, it's kind of the way that this event is putting money back into the community. That money stays here in the community as well. So. Yeah. yeah. And then beyond financially too, like, yeah. So last year, 2020 would have been our 10th year. So obviously we didn't really have an economic impact from that. So that was just the nine years prior. Um, so sadly we, you know, we didn't get to have our big 10th anniversary celebration, which I had some awesome things planned just by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'll have to blow out the 15th year anniversary or something. Um, wow. But but anecdotally, you know, over the years, the marathon has really been responsible for changing the perception, I think, of what Roanoke is, because for most of the people who come from outside of the region, and this is the very first time that they've come to Roanoke. And so I think that, you know, we, I get emails and social media, you know, follow up and stuff after the races of just people being like, I had no idea that Roanoke was such a cool city and like, it just blows their mind. And so for me to hear that, it's like, that's exactly our goal. We, they even designed the course so that it takes them through the most beautiful neighborhoods. It takes them to the best overlooks and the summits so that people are like, it's right in the city. You can literally walk or run up the mountain and have these awesome Blue Ridge views and be in the woods and kind of feel in nature and then come back down through like the eclectic downtown. And then we 
make sure that through Down by Downtown, we have live music everywhere and that it shows the vibrancy of our downtown and everything we have going on and all the breweries. And so we've really put a lot of care into making sure that the runner experience is number one. That's our goal because at the end of the day, we're a nonprofit and our number one goals aren't necessarily about making money. They're about making a big impact on the people who come here. And I think that that's the thing that we've been the most successful at. Well, I think it's it's a, it's part of a larger image building campaign that both that BBR works on, we all work on, and it's like, how is a is a visitor going to even know to, that they should come to Roanoke if they've never heard of the region or anything like that or what it's all about? Same thing with somebody that's a talent that's looking to move or a company that's trying to relocate, and that's you know we're constantly doing what we call a gap analysis. But what's what's missing from our community? What's holding us back from being? the place that people want to live, businesses want to locate, and people want to visit. And uh, that's what the marathon early on was one of our, the things that we identified is there was no kind of key regional uh, outdoor event that would give people a reason to come here. Um, and that's what kind of led us to start the marathon. You know, that gap analysis is what led us to help a climbing gym come here or, and it's also what led us to start the go outside festival as well. It's kind of, again, building a community where people want to be. We're good. We're running out of time. But Landon, I'll give you the last word. You got about 20 seconds. Are you bullish about this year? Could be a fantastic year. Uh, uh, we got the Ironman event coming in in June to kick things off. Huge national tournaments with softball. I think this is the potential for a really fabulous summer. And uh, we're looking forward to getting this uh, pandemic behind us. All right, Landon and Catherine, Pete and Julia, we're running out of time. But thank you all for joining me today. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Gene.